Hey you going guys, welcome to video 3 of this very short, well it's getting longer as I go, but this git primer. So let's recap. In this, in the last video we looked at some practical use of git. We used git config and git config we used to separate, set up some settings, tell git who we were. We used git init and git init created a repository for us. We used git status and git status tells us information about our working copy. We used uh, git add. Now remember that git add had two purposes. The first was to add new files to the repo. And the second was to add files to the changing area. Sorry, the staging area. Remember that unlike subversion and CVS, um, git has this notion of a staging area where we have to add files to before we can commit them. And we didn't really see it in the last video, but this is actually a really powerful thing. Um, we'll probably see it later. So git add was to add new files and to add files to the staging area. Git commit was to commit, commit our changes. commit chags commit changes now remember that git commit only committed changes that we'd added to the staging area which was fine but if we working if we're changing a lot of files for each commit then that becomes a problem so we can use the flag dash a and that tells git to commit all of our changes whether we've staged them or not uh, there was also git reset So git reset cleared the staging area. Git reset dash dash hard cleared our local changes. So make sure you don't get these mixed up. Git reset by itself clears the staging area, but our local changes are still there. Git reset dash hard, dash dash hard actually changes our files back to how they were at the last commit. So this this one's useful if you've completely broken something, but make sure you don't type it by accident because it will bite you. So that's git reset, and the other command we looked at was git log. And git log showed us the history. Now, that was actually a lot to cover in the last video. I actually lied. At the beginning of the last video, I said we'd also look at pushing changes, which we didn't do. So that's what this video is going to be about. It ended up taking longer than I thought to cover this, and we did cover a lot. So in this video, we're going to look at pushing changes to a remote server or a different spot on the hard disk or something like that. So I've gone to screen saver mode. Here we go. Now. Actually, I've changed my mind. Let's go back to the blackboard. In Git, we have our working copy, our local copy. And remember that this is a full repo here. This is not just some checked out files. This is the full history of the repo. Now, in Git, when we do a commit, commits a local when we type in the last video when we type git commit we were committing those to our lo local repository 
they weren't getting put to anywhere else on the net or any other computer or anything. They only exist in our local repository. If we want to push, if we want to get our changes onto some server, we have to do a git push. So this is our server. To get our code over to here, we have to do a push. This is a fundamental difference to how something like subversion works. So when we do a commit in subversion, it gets committed to the server. There's no such thing as local commits. Well, actually, local commits are being developed for subversion now. Now that Git has them and they're awesome, um, they're being integrated into subversion. But at the moment, let's look at this. So we need to push our changes to the server. In the same way, we have to fetch our changes back. If we want to get other changes, we have to fetch them from the server. So there's a couple of extra steps involved compared to non-distributed version control systems. So you might be complaining that it's more work. Well, that's kind of true, but if you're taking that attitude, you're really missing the point. Local commits are good. And the reason is we can do smaller, lots of smaller commits. At different stages. So, and then we only push when we're ready. So in subversion, a typical workflow might be you check out the changes from the server in the morning, you work for eight hours all day, and then you push your changes back to the server. That's really bad because there's eight hours of work where something could go wrong. So here's 9 a.m., here's 5 p.m. So if we, do, if we only do the checkout at 9 a.m. and the push and the commit at 5 p.m., there's eight hours here where my computer can crash here. And then we've lost four hours of work. So, or say something bad happens. Or we mess something up and we can't go back to... Actually, a crash is a bad example because a crash can still affect Git. Let's say that we're working and then here we accidentally deleted a file or did some, or emptied a file or something bad happened. Now, we all we have... The only thing we have the option of doing here is going back to the latest checked out version, which was six hours ago. So we've lost all that work, potentially. If we do something really bad, we've lost six hours of work. In Git, what because changes are lo because commits are local, you can get into the habit of doing more commits at smaller intervals. So we might commit here, commit here, commit here, here, here. We did lots of changes here that we didn't want to break. And then at five, when at the end of the day we do a push, so all of these local commits gets consolidated into one thing that gets pushed to the server. But the advantage is that when we're working on it, we can revert back to any of these little commits as we need to. So lots of smaller commit, you kind of get in the habit of, once you start using Git of doing lots of smaller commits, and it really is a good thing. So local commits are good. It is, it's, and really it's two extra lines of code. It's two extra commands that you have to remember. So it's not a big deal.